Good evening. It's Friday evening. Welcome to the Asian Bird Fair online talk feature, featuring birding destinations around the world. Thank you for joining us on Zoom and on Facebook Live. Tonight, we bring you to Australia with our special guest, one of the foremost bird watchers in Australia, the author of Birds of New Guinea, Mr. Phil Gregory of Sicklebill Safaris. Good evening, Phil. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Wow. Nice, nice to be up here, at least. We are honored for uh, your talking, giving us a talk tonight. So if you're ready. And there's a number of offshore islands as well. You, you've probably heard Christmas Island, Cocos Islands, and there's Norfolk Island and Lord Howe. And they're all um, counted as part of the Australian territories. So um, there's those offshore islands. And then these are, these are the major states. And um, it's, it's actually extremely large. Queensland, where I live, I live up near Cairns, up in the, uh, up in the wet tropics. And... Um, for me to get to Brisbane, it's a probably a, at least a, a day's drive. It's um, If you're flying, it's about three hours. And if you're driving, it's probably something like 12 to 13 hours. So it's a, a very, very big place indeed. So one, one of the things I was going to say tonight is when you're planning to come to Australia, um, be careful where, you, where you're choosing to go. I'm, I'm going to summarise quite briefly some of the best destinations and a, a, a word of advice at the start is don't try and do too much. It's a huge continent. And if you don't have a lot of time, you, you know, you can't possibly do it justice. So the answer really is to make multiple trips. And uh, tonight I'm going to highlight a few um, hot spots or really good areas to visit. And they make very good starting points and then also give you some appetizers on one or two other little bits and pieces. So the photographs 
No, I don't. Basically, there's a team of four of our photographers. So there's, a, there's a few from me. They're mainly the blurry, out of focus ones. And then the really good ones are from the other three, which is Jun Matsui, Scott Baker, and my son, Rowan Gregory, my technical manager here tonight. I think some of you have met Rowan at um, Asian Bird Fair in the past. There's a lovely picture here of the Castlebury drinking at our, in our garden at Castlebury House at Caramba. Old garden. Our old garden. We don't. Look, we we sold it actually in February. We now live up at Topaz on the Atherton Tablelands. So an overview of bird species in Australia. Um, on the mainland itself and the nearby islands, it's something like 855 species. A number of endemics is very high. It's 360, something like 363, depending on whose classification you follow. But say 363 endemics or thereabouts, and there are six endemic families. And summarising the endemic families, I've got them listed here. There's a picture there of a female plains wanderer. That's a monotypic uh, family. Then there's the famous lyrebirds, of course, the scrub birds, the bristle birds, the shrike tits, and then the pardalotes, which are quite widespread. There's four species. And um, I'll talk more about one of those a little bit later on. Um, Queensland is, is a... As I said earlier, it's a massive state. It covers a huge area and it stretches from the tip of Cape York, which is um, actually fairly close to Papua New Guinea. And it goes right the way down to the, the well, it's a really the sort of um, temperate rainforest in sort of central eastern Australia, down just down south of Brisbane. So I, I live in the wet tropics on the, um, around the Atherton Tablelands. And that's a very good area. There's um, something like 15 endemics in this particular region and um, lots of other very special birds. So it's quite a high list for this area. And if you're coming to Australia, I recommend th this area, in particular the wet tropics, is a great starting point. It's, it's also got the advantage of good transport links because it's quite easy. Or in the past, it's always been quite easy to get to Cairns. And then you have a choice of where you, where you want to go. There's a choice of vehicles to hire and which destinations you want to go to. There's a very big choice there. Um, one of the special areas of Queensland is, is Cape York. That's the big finger that sticks up in the northern part of Australia. And people always tend to imagine Cape York as being covered in rainforest. And in actual fact, it's not. It's uh, mostly dry eucalyptus forest and mangrove and scrub. And there's a couple of pockets of rainforest. There's, there's a famous one at a place called Iron Range National Park. And there's another one up at the up near the tip at Bamiga and the Lockerbie scrub in that area right in the far north. But there's a number of very special birds that only occur in Cape York. And this is actually one of the ones that's special on Cape York. This is the magnificent rifle bird. Also occurs in New Guinea, um, but in Australia it's only found on Cape York. So it's a an exciting bird to, to get when you, you come up to the Cape York. It's a it's a special trip. You um but you can drive up, which will take you probably about 12 to 15 hours, or you can fly, which is about a couple of hours flight. And certain times of the year, you can't drive. And certain times of the year, of course, you can't do it because it's, uh, it's too wet and the roads are flooded. So uh, I'll mention some of the climatic hazards and some of the timing things a little bit later on. Still staying with Queensland, if you go down near Brisbane, there's a famous national park there called Lamington National Park. And a very famous guest house there is called O'Reilly's Guest House. And that's a great place to see a number of really special birds. And one of the really good ones there is the Albert's lyrebird. And you also get the, the Paradise rifle bird, the log runner, uh, lots of very exciting um, endemic species. And it's a great place to, uh, to begin a tour, tour in Australia. There you would fly into Brisbane and then go from there. And their flagship bird there is, is a bird called the Regent Bowerbird, which is a very spectacular yellow and black uh, quite tame as well. It comes into feeders right around the lodge at certain times of the year. Then if you're feeling adventurous, you can go over to the Queensland Outback, which is a massive area. It's basically anything which is west of the Great Dividing Range, which is the coastal range that runs north-south. Anything west of that is classified as the Outback. So um, it's an enormous area and there are various points that you can go to. Um, if, if you come to Cairns, for example, we, we could take you over to a place called Georgetown, which is about a four hour drive. And then you get into a whole suite of dry country species. You get you know, cockatiels and budgerigars, emus, things like that. So it's it's very, very different. So the Queensland Outback is um, a totally different experience to the, uh, the wet tropics, completely different set of birds. And of course, 
as always with birding, you want to cover as many key habitats as possible. So uh, it is a really good idea if you have time to try and include at least a brief trip over, over to some part of the outback. Moving on through, we've got a number of field guides in Australia. We're actually, we're sort of embarrassingly well off, really, for field guides. And I've, I've got them pictured here. The most recent one is called the Australian Bird Guide. And um, that's a, it's a, a very good book. It's got the wonderful illustrations, very up-to-date taxonomy, and, uh, and, and a very nice book indeed. There's one peculiar thing with Australian field guides, is they're always a peculiar size. They're either too wide or too narrow or too thick. They're kind, they're kind of odd. They're not like field guides in the rest of the world. I don't know why they can't just pick a, a standard size that easily fits in your pocket. So uh, they, they're quite awkward in some ways. But there's plenty of choice to, to go with. So there's those those particular ones there. And that, also that very nice photo guide by um, Ian Campbell and company. That's, that's also a very good book. So plenty of choice for good books and you can do your homework before you come. Uh, New South Wales, that's the, the state just to the south of Queensland. Um, key birding sites for New South Wales. Well, there's a very famous one called Royal National Park, which is very close to Sydney. If you want to go into Royal National Park from the, the outskirts of Sydney, you can be there in 45 minutes. It's very close. And there's a lot of really good birds to, to be found in Royal. And one of them is here. One, the one that uh, people really want to see, of course, is the, uh, the world's largest passerine which is the, um, the, the superb lyrebird. So um, a very good chance of seeing that on several of the, the walks and drives in Royal National Park. So it's a, it's a great place to start off. And you, you may see other birds there. You can see um, green cat birds, um, fairly widespread there. You may see satin bower bird. There's a couple of special ones. There's um, New South Wales only endemic bird is a thing called the rock warbler or erygma. And it is possible to see that in Royal National Park. So it is a it is a good place to sort of start off. Uh, if you go to Sydney, we definitely go to Royal National Park. It's a, a really wonderful place to, to start off with and, and very accessible. So very, very close to Sydney, not too far to travel. If you're feeling a bit more adventurous, you can go inland and you'll, you'll head more or less due west across the Great Dividing Range, the Blue Mountains, and you get into what a place that we recommend is, is called the Caper Tea Valley. And um, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous area. And it's uh, completely different to um, many other parts of Australia. It's sort of quite a bit of cultivation, but there's a lot of uh, dry woodland there as well. And there are some wonderful birds to be found. So turquoise parrots are a good bet, diamond firetails, um, Maybe gang gang cockatoo if you're lucky. If you're lucky, you can find the erygma or rock warbler there. And it's a splendid birding experience. I think the first time I went there, which is depressingly long time ago now, but I think I got something like uh, 30 lifers in one day. So I was, I was very happy with that. It was, a, it was a great place to begin. And if, you, if you're down in um, New, New South Wales as well, do try and get on, on a pelagic trip. So go, go out on a Wollongong pelagic and wonderful for um, various sorts of seabirds, so albatross species, prions, um, shearwaters, all sorts of things. So very exciting to get on the pelagic trip, but uh, do make sure you book well in advance and be aware that there's a fairly high risk of cancellation due to bad weather. So um, if you if you got the opportunity, try and leave a window in your itinerary. If it does get cancelled one day, might go out the next day. So just be aware of that. Um, Victoria, that's the, the southern southernmost mainland state. If you go south from um, New South Wales, you get into Victoria. And uh, there's some not around Melbourne, there's some some good some good birding to be had. Um, the famous place near Melbourne, of course, is Werribee Sewage Farm. Uh, the joke in Australia is that Sydney's got Royal National Park and Melbourne's got Werribee Sewage Farm. But Werribee is a, a very good place for well for ducks and shorebirds in particular. And uh, it's certainly a, a very interesting introduction to go there. You can see a lot of the uh, endemic Australian ducks. You know, you'll see musk ducks and Australian shovelers and hardheads and lots of very very attractive ducks. So definitely worth definitely worth a look. Maybe freckled duck if you're lucky. So um, the um, Werribee Sewage Farm is a good place to go. Uh, another nice place to, to, to head, head up is the Chiltern area, what's called the box ironbark country. That's a particular type of tree. 
And you've got a lot, lot of special species there. One of the great flagship birds for this is the Regent honey eater. And this is a very large, spectacular uh, black and yellow honey eater. And it's at grave danger of extinction. The, the most recent censuses are giving something like three to 400 birds. So it really is at death's door. So it's um, in great trouble, critically endangered. And they are doing some captive breeding and some releases. Small numbers of birds are going in to try and supplement the existing wild population. There's also some attempts to revegetate. We have, we have a big problem in Australia with um, land clearance and um, so a lot of local groups are trying to do their bit to try and revegetate certain areas and get some of the key species restored. So the box ironbark country, the Chilterns, is one area where there's doing a lot of great work to try and restore chunks of the country so it's suitable again for the suite of rare species, including the, um, the Regent honey eater. And also, uh, another site in Victoria is, is what's called the Mallee. And Mallee is a species of uh, acacia. And it's a, quite a low, dense, shrubby tree, and it covers very large areas out in the western, drier parts of the state. And it's got a lot of very special birds. So um, if you get into the Mallee, you'll be looking for um, or Mallee emu wren as a possibility, and uh, possibly striated grass wren. And um, you start getting into all sorts of different parrots. You could get mulga parrot. Um, you might start getting into Mallee fowl, the big... Um, the big um, game bird type bird that lives in, in the Mallee. That's uh, another one. So the Mallee is a very good region. Uh, if you get into the Mallee, though, do be careful because it's very, very easy to get lost there. Because so once you get into the into the woodland, you haven't got any landmarks. The country is pretty flat. Um, so you really do need to try and get a bearing on the sun or have a GPS compass. Just be careful. Try not to get lost because it is quite easy to lose your, you lose your bearings in country like that. Uh, moving on down the southernmost state of them all, it's a, a separate island. This is Tasmania, and that, that is a very nice um, destination for a, a, sh a short trip. Um, it has, nowadays it's 13 endemics, the splitting of the uh, Tasmanian Blue Book. There's now 13 endemics on Tasmania. It is possible, if you're really sort of gung-ho and very enthusiast enthusiastic, you can get them all in one day, but... Um, I recommend you take a, a few days to enjoy the, the beautiful island. Uh, go in th to Hobart, usually, or possibly Launceston, but Hobart, usually. And then Bruny Island is a great place to start. And that's uh, about a 45-minute drive and then a short ferry crossing across to beautiful Bruny Island, which has got some very nice habitat there. And it's got most, of, almost all of the endemics, in fact, are on Bruny Island. And one of the flagship birds is here beside beside the, um, the edge of the slide, and that's the 40-spotted pardalote, which has got a few hundred pairs in the world. That's the global population. And Bruny Island is a great place to see it. There's a place called Inala on Bruny Island, which is a wonderful spot to go and see 40-spotted pardalotes and a very nice place to stay. So Bruny is a great place, and it is possible to see just about all of the Tasmanian endemics on Bruny. Another place that on your itinerary you should certainly try and go to is Cradle Mountain, which is basically it's in central Tasmania. If you were to drive from Bruni, probably take you maybe four hours to get there. And very nice, very nice drive on quite good roads, very scenic country, lots of eucalyptus woodland. And um, you can uh, you can see a lot of very, very special birds and also mammals. Tasmania is a great place for mammals. So um you can, if you're very lucky, you might get to see the Tasmanian devil, which has um, lost about 75% of its population in the last few years due to a, um, an unfortunate virus. Um, but um, it's, it's hanging on in a few places and you can still see them around Cradle Mountain. And you, you can get some of the endemic birds there as well, the special birds. Pink robin is one that's very much uh, in vogue for Tasmania, and that's a very good place to see it, is actually at Cradle Mountain. So there's some, some lovely things to find there. And uh, most of the endemics can also be found there. And another one you can do um, if, you're, if you're heading back round, back to um, Launceston or Hobart or something, is Tamar Valley Wetlands. And if you go there, you've got quite a good chance of seeing the Cape Barren Goose or Cereopsis and um, a selection of the Australian um, wetland birds, you know, things like black swan, Australian shell ducks, 
and possibly little grass bird. Some very nice birds to be seen just in the Tamar Valley wetlands. Well, well worth a look and you can spend a day there quite happily. Uh, moving on round um, South Australia, we're heading, we've headed um, sort of west, a little bit west, we're in the central central part of Australia now. And South Australia is a great spot. Um, Adelaide is the main town there. And you can go to the key spots here, the Flinders Ranges, very attractive, low, dry hills, um, the Streslecky Track, and that, that goes really inland, way, way, way inland. It's, a, it's right into the heart of the outback, You're heading up to a place called Inaminka. And um, you can see a lot of the, uh, the deep desert birds there. So you may see inland doctoral, um, you can see gibber bird, you might see the cri uh, crimson and orange chats, um, ground cuckoo shrike, possibly letter wing kite if you're really lucky, uh, thick billed grass wren, and chestnut breasted whiteface, a lot of the special birds that are found on that Streslecky track. It's really four wheel drive only, um, but it's actually in very good condition because the track actually goes up to a gas field. So they keep it in very good order. And it's, it's actually quite an e a surprisingly easy drive. So it's um, uh, well worth doing. It will give you a sort of a touch of the outback and the desert birding. So the Streslecky track, um, starting from Adelaide, driving up to a place called Lindhurst and then heading north from there is, is really well worth doing. It's, it's a great experience. And an, another key spot down there, if you're going to go to South Australia, going to Adelaide, go to a reserve called Gloopot Reserve, which is it's named Gloopot because the soil there, when it gets wet, is so sticky. So it's called Gloopot after the very sticky soil on the reserve. And it's a, it's a good place to see... Um, some pretty hard birds. You, you, you can see a Red Lord Whistler there, which is a very difficult Mallee bird. Um, you, can, you can sometimes they see Scarlet Chested Parrot there. That's a possibility. And it's and, oh, the, the, the special one there is the Black Eared Miner. It's a critically endangered species. And Glue Pot is probably the best place to see it in the whole world. So uh, a lot of very special birds in these parts of South Australia. Um, going over then to Western Australia, it's a massive area and we've really just concentrated on a, a handful of spots here. But um, if, if you're going to go there, the one that you must go to is the southwest corner. So you basically this is accessed from Perth and then out of Perth, you sort of radiate sort of south and then back towards the, the, the southeast. And um, most sites are within like three to four hour drive of Perth and you can see most of the, uh, the Western Australian endemics, I think there's 15 endemics in Western Australia, and you can get them all in that southwest corner. And there's some of the most difficult birds to, in, um, in the whole country there. You can see uh, the noisy scrub bird is one, which is a very hard bird restricted to a handful of special reserves just uh, in the southwest corner here. But it is, there's a place called Chains Beach Caravan Park. And if you stay there, they've, they've actually got noisy scrub birds in the, uh, the heathland around the caravan park. And if you go to the right spot and wait quietly, you've got quite a good chance of seeing one cross a track. And um, sometimes you can actually see them very well. And this was a bird which was almost impossible to see for uh, a very long time. And recently it's become a little bit easier. So um, possible now to see the noisy scrub bird. You've also got the Western bristle bird in the same area another endemic family and another one which is a, a major rare skulky bird. And there's also um, the whipbird there, the western whipbird. That's also to be seen in this, this, this same area. So it's a, a really good place for those three uh, mega rare, very skulking species. So if you allowed yourself a couple of days, you've got a very good chance of connecting with all of those, subject, of course, to weather, because this is a this can be a wet and windy place. So you need to be a little bit lucky with the weather. So spring and summer really is, is the time to go. Uh, some wonderful parrots there. We've got this red cap parrot on the on the photograph here, which is a beautiful endemic for the southwest corner. We've got the western corella. And you've also got the Carnabies and Bodans um, black cockatoos. So there's some really nice parrots to see down in this part of the world as well. And then the Northern Territory. So I've done a quick gallop sort of clockwise around the continent. But um, the, the capital city here is Darwin. And the Darwin area is a, a splendid place to go. And um, 
Darwin Botanic Gardens, you may see Rufus Owl. If you go to Buffalo Creek, you might be lucky and get a chestnut rail. A um, lot of mangrove birds, yellow white eyes and red-headed honey eaters and all that sort of stuff. So it's a, a great spot to go. There's a place for rainbow pitta, which is as pitta's go. It must be the easiest pitta in the world. Very photographable and can be seen quite easily quite close to Darwin. So Darwin is a, a great place to start. And it's also your jumping off point for the great Kakadu National Park. Um, to get to the park from Darwin, I'll oh, say three hours to the northern edge of the park, and then you can decide where you want to stay and um, work out from there. And then once you get into the sandstone escarpments, there's a lot of very special birds to try for. So the sandstone shrike thrush, the white-lined honey eater, black-banded fruit dove, chestnut-quilled rock pigeon. In days gone by, you used to get white-throated grass wren, but sadly, most of the accessible sites have lost their populations. I think it's a combination of too much burning and possibly heat stress. I'm very worried about the effects that these rising temperatures are having on some of these quite sensitive um, dry country species. And I think hot temperatures could be a real problem for uh, quite a number of species in Australia. But Kakadu is a, a great place to go. The, the parrot here is a hooded parrot. Um, this is a parrot that nests in anthill mounds. Just uh, the best place to see this is around Pine Creek. And they come right into the centre of Pine Creek. Uh, there's a water tank on a hill just overlooking the town. If you go up there early morning, late afternoon, you've got a very good chance of seeing hooded parrots. And the other place you can see them is smack bang in the middle of town. They've got a little park there with some wetland. And there are frequently hood, hooded parrots at this little park right in the centre of uh, Pine Creek. So it's a great place to see this very rare bird. Its total population is probably several thousand birds. That's it. And it's, it's endemic to the Northern Territory. So it's a, a really great place to go. And it's a, another one which is a great favourite, of course, with photographers. And um, got, of course, another thing with Kakadu is um, some of the Aboriginal artwork and cultural things. There are some beautiful cultural centres to visit, which uh, give you a real good insight into the Indigenous uh, people's way of life here. And there's some wonderful rock art sites. So if you go to Norlangi Rock or Ubir, I really recommend those. They're good bird sites as well. You can see some of the special birds there. There's also some wonderful Aboriginal rock art. So you've got a, a nice extra dimension to a trip there, which uh, you can take in without, um, without spending too much time on it. And the other one in the Northern Territory is you go down right more or less to the centre of Australia, and it's still in the Northern Territory because this is such a big state. This is Alice Springs, and this is very different, um, semi-arid terrain. It's a low, very ancient sandstone um, mountain ranges, but they're all worn down. So they're actually very low, quite rugged, and some wonderful birding around Alice Springs. So you can see dusky grass wren, rufous crowned emu wren, uh, Major Mitchell's cockatoo, budgerigars, of course, cockatiels, lots and lots of different things, painted fire tails. So th there's a huge amount of birds to be found around Alice Springs. And again, uh, well worth spending two or three days in this area, just having a look around. And so the top five birding destinations, I've just taken you on a, a quick gallop around them. We started off in the wet tropics of North Queensland. And then we, we went down um, over to well, southwest, Western Australia was the one I dealt with recently. Then the top end, that was the one I was just talking about just now. Then you've got Tasmania right in the far south. And then the Caperty Valley, that was inland from, uh, from Sydney. So these are five great birding destinations that you can uh, start your trip to Australia with. So these, these are all strongly recommended. So moving through a little bit here. Um, the Atherton Tablelands, well, we, we have got something like 430 species, and you can expect, if you spend a week here, you would probably see well over 200, I would think. Um, something like 40% of Australia's bird species are found in the wet tropics, and there are some 15 endemic birds here. And we've got a little, a little uh, montage of the endemic birds here. So um, the yellow one at the top is the golden, golden bowerbird, and next to that is a lesser sooty owl and um, there's various honey eaters there's um, you can see Maclay's honey eater that's the spotty one 
And then there's um, the cryptic honey eater. That's a newly split species, which used to be called graceful honey eater, but now it's been rebranded and it's now the cryptic honey eater. And that's fairly common in this area. You've got the bridled honey eater, the fern wren, um, chow chilla, and there's pied monarch at the bottom right. So lots of uh, different endemics to be found in, in this particular area. And also some very good mammals, so rock wallabies, kangaroos, tree kangaroos, platypus, lots and lots of different mammals to be seen. So it's a nice extra dimension to a birding trip is the mammals can be taken in quite easily. And they're often very close or actually at some of the great birding sites. Um, some special birds now, this is Victoria's rifle bird. This is a wet tropics endemic. Uh, where we now live up at Topaz near Malanda, we actually get them coming to our feeders. And one of, one of the keys to if you want rifle birds to come to your feeders, put some cheese out. And they're great addicts for cheese. And, and they're quite particular. They're like vintage cheddar cheese. And uh, we put cheese out every morning and we get rifle birds every day. They also come for bananas. So you can, you can be cheaper as well and go for bananas also. So here you've got a male, it's a female plumage one, and they do this wonderful um, butterfly display with the wings up around the head and we're, uh, switching from side to side. So if you come in July, August, September, October, you, you'll see them in display, which is a, a wonderful sight and very, very photogenic, of course. Uh, another great attraction here is the golden bowerbird. And he, he's, um, this is a male bird. And he does a very unusual bower. That um, load of sticks you can see on the... Um, the second slide, the second picture at the top, that's his bower. It's what we call a twin maypole bower. And he decorates it with lichen and those greenish orchid flowers. And you can see the bird at the bottom is actually carrying a greenish orchid flower in his beak. And he decorates this, um, this structure with um, lichen and orchid flowers. And so some of the older bowers, uh, they can be in use for like 20 odd years. And some of the older ones are maybe, um, two to three meters tall. They're quite spectacular and, and they can last a long time. And uh, the birds seem to be quite long lived. So uh, it may be that uh, a particular male could be 10, 15 years old. So um, there's one or two sites where there's very well-known bowers. And of course, it's a great favorite with the photographers. Uh, this is one of the hardest of the endemics. And this is the lesser sooty owl. It's like a small version of the sooty owl but this one is only found in the wet tropics and it's got a wonderful call. It sounds a bit like a falling bomb, a sort of whistle, a descending whistle call. Very tricky to find. Um, they're tough, tough to get, but there are one or two places where with a bit of perseverance, you've got a pretty good chance of seeing them. I've actually got them in, in, in our rainforest property at the back of us here. And this is always a great favourite, the Papuan frogmouth, this huge bill. It's a very large bird. People are always surprised how big they are. They really are a surprisingly large species and um, very, very cryptic, very well camouflaged. Um, they look like a piece of dead wood, basically. Um, but this is a bird you'll definitely get to see in the wet tropics. If you do a Daintree river cruise, the boatmen generally know where this roosting birds or nesting birds. And this is a species you can expect to see in the wet tropics. It's also in New Guinea, of course. Uh, this is one of my favourites. I took this photograph a couple of weeks ago over near Georgetown, and this male was in a car park, and he was very agitated, and he had his lilac crest all fluffed out, so it looks like a lilac daisy on the back of his head. But I was really pleased to see it, because you don't often see them like that. Often the, the crest is not erected, so you don't realise he's actually got this. But this one was very jazzed up, very agitated, so I was quite pleased to get that shot of him. And this is his bower. His bower is like a, what we would call an avenue bower. It's built of sticks. This is not a nest. It's a display site. And uh, outside there's an apron of, um, <coughs> excuse me, can be stones or shells or bones. And it's also decorated with you know, sometimes bits of plastic and bits of greenery. And there's an apron either side of this, uh, this material, which is like the approach ramp for the, to lure the females in. This is a chow chiller. <clears throat> it's another wet tropics endemic, a skulky bird of the rainforest. And uh, you'll hear them first thing in the morning. They sing at first light and they're very, very noisy. And uh, there's a couple of very good places you, you can get to see them. They're quite shy. Uh, but Jun Matsui got a very good picture of this particular. And this is this is a, a female with a red throat. 
and I, I can't resist putting this one in uh, my excuses. It's got a duck bill, so it's a it's a duck billed platypus, and uh, they're actually quite easy to see on the tablelands. We actually have a site where you can go in daylight, and they're they're um they're not worried about people. They just come swimming by and pottering about, and you can you know you can just watch them and in broad daylight, and then you can have fish and chips or a lunch at the spot. So we do a we do a lunch with platypus or sometimes a breakfast with platypus. So platypus is actually quite easy to find here. You don't have to see them at night time. You can get them in the daytime at one or two places. So that's a very iconic special mammal that people are always very keen to see. And then briefly through southwest Western Australia, a very high species count, 16 endemics, that's a lot. And um, this is one, this is, I think is a red winged fairy wren, if I remember rightly. That's an endemic, and here's your Carnaby's black cockatoo, which is a southwestern endemic. So a beautiful thing to see and quite photogenic. Oh, black swan. Well, I couldn't resist putting that in. It's a lovely bird, fairly common, and it's the state bird for Western Australia. So that's my excuse. And red-eared firetail. That's a Western Australian endemic. Quite a hard one to find, but there's a couple of good places where there's a very good chance of seeing it. And as you can see, it's a very beautiful bird. Then the top end, this was based around Darwin, um, 280 species in Kakadu National Park, 200 plus species around Alice Springs, and in the top end itself, six endemics. And one of the top end endemics is this, uh, the pitta, this is the, um, <coughs> the rainbow pitta. And this is one of the easy pitters. There's a couple of places where if you go early morning, you can see them just hopping on the footpath in front of you and you can get very nice photographs. So as pitters go, this one is a real show off. It's, it makes a refreshing change. Pitters normally so difficult, as I'm sure you're well aware. But this one is a relatively easy pitter. So um, very nice thing to look forward to if you come to the top end. This is another uh, endemic for the top end. This is the chestnut quilled rock pigeon, which lives up on the sandstone escarpments. And um, it's quite a shy bird and it sort of tucks itself away, but there's a good chance you'll see them at several of the spots that we can go to to get this one, chestnut quilled rock pigeon. And th this one, it's, uh, Australia's got an embarrassment of honey eaters, like there's over 70 species, 74 species from memory. This particular one is endemic to, um, the top end, uh, mainly in Kakadu, is like the epicenter for this, the white lined honey eater. And if you go to Kakadu National Park early morning, you can hear them singing. They've got a lovely, wild, sweet song. And this is one that you would definitely see in the in the top end. And if you go to Darwin, there's a couple of good places to see Rufus Owl. And this is, of course, a, a real crowd pleaser. And um, it's a big owl as well, very large, large species, about buzzard size owl and very spectacular. And quickly through Tasmania, 13 endemics. This is a Cape Barren Goose or Cereopsis, just to show that one off. And the Tasmanian native hen, they're quite common. This is actually a flightless bird, oddly enough, and they seem to survive quite well. There are, luckily, there are no foxes or dingoes in Tasmania, so they seem to be able to deal with the cats and wild dogs or feral dogs. So the Tasmanian native hen, a, a giant flightless rallied, which is fairly common in, in much of the state. Black currawong, that's endemic to Tasmania and um, easily seen at Cradle Mountain. And over here, I just stuck this one in. This is if, if you want to see this, well, my advice is do it sooner rather than later, because this is the orange-bellied parrot. It's one of the most endangered species on the planet. Um, the wild count a couple of years ago was, I think it was 13 individuals, and they've been supplementing the, that population with the releases of captive birds, um, but they're still you know, 120 birds left, something like that. And they, they have a horrible migration route where they fly across the, the, uh, the Bass Strait and winter somewhere in the southern parts of Australia. And we actually don't know where at the moment. We don't know where they've gone. So they're trying to um, radio tag them and find out exactly where these things go. So this is orange-bellied parrot anyway. If you want to see it, there is one place you can fly to in Tasmania where it's possible to see orange-bellied parrot. And this is another one, a great favourite here is pink robin. It's a high altitude robin species with that wonderful pink colour. I don't know another bird's got quite that colour. So it's a male pink robin. It's uh, quite easily seen at Cradle Mountain. And of course, the Tasmanian devil, which I mentioned briefly earlier. 
Um, that's uh, possible to see that around Cradle Mountain, uh, sadly much declined, but still possible. And it's uh, nocturnal, of course. And the Capiti Valley, um, I mentioned the Regent Honey Eater. This, is a, this parrot here is the swift parrot that actually nests in Tasmania and migrates to, to winter on the southern mainland. And it's uh, become critically endangered, mainly due to habitat loss. So um, that's a particular uh, possibility down in the, in the Cape of Tea Valley. Gang Gang Cockatoo, another, uh, one, another one of our wonderful parrots. It's possible to get that in the Cape of Tea. Hooded Robin, that's fairly common in much of the dry country in Australia. And very quickly through other Australian birds, golden-shouldered parrot, that's a Cape York special, about 3,000 birds in total. Another one of these ones that nests in termite mounds. And if you do one of our Cape York trips, uh, you can certainly see those, but you need to come uh, late winter and early spring. D don't leave it too late. If you October on, it's getting a bit late and they've dispersed a lot, they're much more difficult. So July, August, September, good time to come and see those. Palm cockatoo, very spectacular, much in demand, quite easy to see up Cape York. It's also, of course, a New Guinea species, but uh, easy to see uh, certain areas in Cape York. Wedge-tailed eagle, that's actually quite um, widespread over much of in inland Australia, and that's a bird you would definitely see somewhere in your travels in Australia. Busted, Australian busted, this is a male in display. And uh, if you come to the wet tropics, we've got some good spots. You can see these for sure. Red-tailed black cockatoo. This is one of the great birds of the wet tropics. Um, they're very vocal, very noisy. And anywhere around um, Darwin, you'll get them. And of course, around uh, the Atherton Table, another good place to see red-tailed black cockatoos. And they even go down to southwest Western Australia. Spinifex pigeon, dry country bird. If you go over to Georgetown in the wet tropics, you'll, you should see these. Oh, emu, of course, that's an iconic species for the inland dry areas. Very good chance of seeing that. If you go to Georgetown in the wet tropics, good chance to catch, catch up with this one. Sacred kingfisher, very widespread. Kingfishers, of course, much in demand, but for people, and this is one of the common ones in Australia. Uh, lovely fairy wren, that's one of the beautiful rainforest fairy wrens. And as fairy wrens go, this one's actually a hard one to see because they're quite skulking. Most of the fairy wrens are quite easy. They're quite tame, often quite confiding. This one is quite shy, quite skulking, quite weary. So it's a real prize to, to get a lovely fairy wren, but good chance around the wet tropics. And my last slide tonight is the um, Gouldian finch. And this is a very beautiful, much prized cage bird, of course. It's a, a, probably far more in captivity than there are in the wild. But if you want to see them, you can you can certainly get them in, in the Northern Territory. So um, there's some good sites in Kakadu. And if you go over to a place called Kananara in Western Australia, there's some wonderful places you can see and photograph wild Gordian finches. And their numbers have actually come back quite well in the last five or six years. The, um, they seem to, the population seems to have picked up and um, num they're in quite good numbers at the moment. It seems to have had a series of good breeding seasons. So it's so an optimistic note to end this presentation with. So um, that's Australia in 45 minutes. So um, I hope that's of some use to you. And um, I'm finished there. I'll just flick back to that Gordian. It's a nice one to stop on. And if you have any queries, comments or questions, I'm at, you, at your disposal. Thank you. You can turn off your presentation first. <clears throat> okay. Mr. Logistics. <laughs> okay. Thank yep, you. Done. Wow, that was a very <laughs> nice presentation. Uh, you make oh, me want to. It was a very brief gallop. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I hope it gets you interested in coming anyway. So that's, that's yeah. the whole point. So. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? You may ask them now. <laughs> no? <laughs> It was very, very succinct, just a, a very a snapshot, literally. So uh, yeah. if you're going to come, uh, what, one word of advice is avoid the rainy season in the tropical north. So that's really from, well, I mean, the rainy season is supposed to start in November and it will go through till March, April. 
if you come to the north, that's um, hot and very humid and can be very wet. So you, you might want to think carefully if you want to, to experience the wet season. It's all right down in southern Australia, but in the north, uh, it can uh, cause complications with the log logistics. So um, be aware of that if you come. So the ideal time to come, of course, is um, late winter, early spring. So July, August, September, that's a wonderful time to visit. So um, that, that's strongly recommended. Phil, you have this casuaries, which are they're dangerous, right? <laughs> if you get too near to them. Um, well, I mean, be careful with them. We used to live at a place called Cassowary House, and we had a we had an old an old male bird there, and we we had him for about forty years actually. He was at the property for about forty years, and he used to bring his youngsters in every year. And when when they've got babies, you need to be very careful with them. You know, you don't want to get between the babies and the adult cassowary. So you, you know, basically, the the golden rule is keep your distance, don't crowd them, and don't alarm them. Um, don't also don't feed them. Don't don't try and hand feed them. That's not a good idea. Um, cassowaries tend to be quite inquisitive. So sometimes, especially the birds that are more habituated, they might come and have a look at you. So um, people often misinterpret this as an attack, which is it's actually not so. Uh, Cassowary attacks are, are very rare, and they're generally when they're provoked. So people have run into them or, or trying to grab them or done something really dumb. So if, if you do that, then yes, yes, you could have a problem. But um, most of the, the major, well, all the major industry uh, injuries with cassowaries in recent times have been when they've been hunted in New Guinea, for example, or they've been attacked by dogs, or people have tried to pick up a chick or something ridiculous like that. So um, th that's asking for trouble. But otherwise, you know, just common sense, keep your distance, don't crowd them, give them plenty of space, and don't frighten them. Yeah, and then you shouldn't really have any problem and back off. As if they're showing signs of distress, just back off a little bit and it sh shouldn't be a problem. So it's a wonderful bird to see. And there's some very good places in the wet tropics where you can actually get to see them uh, very well and get very good views, good photographs, good videos, very nice. So it's, it's a wonderful bird, a real flagship bird. Are there other... Um... Dangerous animals that we should look out for. <laughs> <laughs> well, Australians in, Australians in general, especially near pubs. Um, but uh, no, um, snakes, you need to do be aware of snakes. Uh, snakes are quite common. Um, but again, you know, I, I, I do, you know, done a lot of bush, wash, bush, bush walking and trips and stuff. And generally snakes will get out your way. They, they'll sense you coming and they move out your way, or if you get really close to them, like, I saw a red-bellied black two days ago, and he saw me coming, and he just took off. That was it. He's gone. But just be careful where you put your feet, because often early morning, they come out to sun on the track, and it's, pos it's possible you might step on one, and they take a fairly dim view of that. So um, j just be aware of them, but um, just just be careful. You know, keep your eyes open, watch where you're going, and don't take unnecessary risks. So that they are here. They are quite common. Generally, you don't see them. They, they keep out your way. And um, you know, if you want to go find them, yes, you can. But um, I, I mean, typically, if I did a three-week trip around Australia, if I'm lucky, I might see one or two snakes. That's it. So uh, not much. I've actually got them in my roof if anybody really wants to come and see them. I've got a python living in my loft at the moment. But um, anyway, um, snakes, snakes are quite common. So, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I should actually also mention some of the vegetation. There's, there's a particularly nasty tree we have here called a stinging tree, which has a, a heart-shaped leaf with little, little sort of a serrated edge. And you want to be careful with that because stinging trees, as the name suggests, they will sting and it's very painful and it's not easily cured. If you, if you walk in, I did once walk into a stinging tree when I was doing something looking for a golden bird, I wasn't paying attention and I, I brushed against one and it was really very painful. I ended up having to go to a, a pharmacy and get some hair removal stuff which you stick on your leg. It's like you have to heat it up. It's like a wax. You stick it on your leg then you tear it off and it rips off all the hairs on your leg. It also pulls out all, this, all the um, silica spines from the stinging tree. I had to give it two treatments with that because if you don't treat it, it'll last for for um, two three weeks. So it's, um, so it can it can be quite serious. So stinging trees, be aware of them. 
make sure you know what they look like. They're not that common, and you'd be very unlucky to run into one. But you, but you can. You need to be. Do, it's one of those things. You know, we brief people, and we, if you come on one of our tours, we'd actually show you a stinging tree and say, you don't shake hands with this thing because it's it's not recommended. So uh, stinging trees. Are, um, yeah, it's 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 here, but it's it's not super common. But um, yeah, they are here. So um, other pests, well, snakes we mentioned. Uh, old spiders. There are some quite nasty spiders around. I'm going to put you off here. I shouldn't be doing this, but um, <laughs> there are spiders. Don't pick spiders up. It's quite simple. So um, yeah, yeah. So just be careful. Avoid spiders. Can give you a nasty bite. So um, you know, don't go fondling them. Don't pick them up. Just leave, leave them alone. You shouldn't have any problem. And it, <laughs> my son is saying you should check your toilet in the outback. Check, check your the toilet seat in the outback. Just make sure that there's nothing sitting on it. I'm, <laughs> you're not expecting yeah so anyway redback spiders can be it can be an issue but uh, we're trying to sell australia here not put you off so um any more any other questions queries comments whatever i'm, I'm at your disposal agenda <laughs> <laughs> Thank good evening. You. Good evening, everyone. Somebody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Phil. Okay. I, 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 I don't have a question. I think I think myself to go to Australia is the best place. So I will I will enjoy and see everything. <laughs> Oh but yes, think, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a fantastic place to visit. I mean, it's it's easy to do. There's plenty to choose from, and it's very, very varied. So you know, the choice is is up to you. We we're, we're here. We're happy to advise. We you know, we've got all sorts of trips we can offer, and um, there's plenty of things that we can point you towards. Be it birds, mammals, butterflies, whatever. There's all sorts of things you can do. And the, the list is actually uh, very long, very complex. So um, we're happy to advise and point you in the right direction if you've got a group you want to bring of course feel free and um, you know we can set things up for you so that's one of the things we do so uh, we're hoping for better times next year of course because this year of course has been a year of stasis so um, we, we can maybe we can see a bit of light at the end of the tunnel for next year we hope so um, yeah fingers crossed okay let's hear from rajendra from nepal hello phil good evening from Good Nepal. Evening. Hey, hello. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, it was really wonderful presentation. Really wants to more about Australia. Well, um, I hope it, I hope it wets the appetite. Yeah, you know, it's a, a continent in forty-five minutes. There you are. So yeah, yeah. So so thank you. So I would like to ask simple questions. You know that the Australian yes. forest fire did make any uh, um, Changes in the bird life in uh, Australia, the, the forest fire. Have you noticed any well, sort of changes about the forest fire? Because we heard the well, big I mean, forest fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was, well, very serious. I mean, the areas affected, which are fortunately well south of us, but it was certainly very devastating. I mean, billions of, of species were were killed in the fires. The habitat has been seriously damaged, and it must have been. A, Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of birds must have died. Many, very many mammals. There may be a couple of mammal species that possibly may have gone extinct because of it. So it's certainly been very, very serious. Um, but you know, that's the nature of where we are these days with climate change and all this. And I fear such things are going to become uh, ever more frequent. So uh, very serious damage. Um, nature is very resilient. So I'm actually optimistic that in time things will cover. Maybe some steps could be taken to mitigate some of the things that helped exacerbate the problem. Um, but, um, yeah, it was certainly very, 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 very serious and terrifying for the people that were down there. It was awful to watch it and hear about it. It was, uh, yeah, it was a, a terrible start to the year. But fortunately, this year, much better rain. So we're not going to get a recurrence of that this year, I'm happy to say. And hopefully it will regenerate, recover. And nature has wonderful capabilities to um, renew itself. So I'm, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic. It won't be quite as bad as, as we're as we're fearing at one time. So. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank. Thank you, BF. 
So Nepal, actually Nepal is uh, started to celebrate the festival from today onwards. And today is the oh, day okay. of our, okay, the crow day. So we celebrate the five days long. So today is the day of crow, is in fact the bird day, yeah? We, we fit oh, okay. the, uh, no, well, it's very, very yeah, appropriate. We, yeah, <laughs> we fit the foods for we, uh, actually, crow. We put the food in the rooftop and we wish each other and tomorrow is our dog day and the after is cow day. Oh, oh. And so <laughs> oh, I see. No, okay. <laughs> well, I'll look out for a Theresian crow tomorrow. Maybe I can feed one of those for you. <laughs> uh, so it's our festival day here. So uh, wish you a happy festival from the Himalaya to you all. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I wish I was there. It sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, ABF team, Mike, pictures, everyone. Thank you very much, anyway. Victor? <laughs> no more? Is everybody <laughs> happy? <laughs> well, then let's take a group photo. Ah, OK. See? Yeah. So uh, before we go, let's take oh, a group photo. Yeah. Everyone, come on screen. Yeah, Richard, Chubzan. <laughs> Hi, Chubzan. We don't see you. Rhea. Rhea. Okay. Wow. All right, let's go. Okay. Three. Oh, look at the camera. Three, two, one. Thank you very much. Excellent. Okay. okay. All right. Well, th thank you so much thank for the opportunity, and um, I wish you all uh, the very best for next year. Anyway, let's hope for great, better times ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. And before we thank go, you so much. Uh, yeah. And before we go next week, our uh, speaker is uh, Carlos Bethancourt of Panama. Right. Oh yeah. Hey. Good friend, Carlos. Excellent. Okay. All right, Thank I'll try and have a look. That'll be good. Ladies and gentlemen, okay. have a nice weekend. Thank okay. you again. Thank, Thank you so much. You. And you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Rowan. <laughs> hey, Rowan. Yeah, you've got to say Rowan. goodbye. Hello and goodbye. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi, <laughs> Rowan. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.